this is the perfect panel to examine how law and order became a global phenomenon. Uh, on this panel, we're going to want to look into, you know, how, why, but we really want to look into the economic, the social, the legal, the aesthetic, political nuts and bolts of translating law and order, both in syndication and in the creation of local original programming uh, based on law and order. Uh, so I'd like to start off by um, asking Charles Engel, uh, who is, oh, well, I should introduce you first. Um, so Barbara Vallee uh, holds many titles. I'm going to make this really short. Uh, but the most important one for this panel is uh, head of research about images of justice at the Institute of Advanced Judicial Studies in Paris. Uh, she has written television in the legal system. I hope you like me flogging your book Thank you as a fellow much. academic, uh, which compares the history of American TV productions uh, of courtroom series uh, with French productions. Uh, and she is also writing two books on law and order coming up. Uh, Linus Roach played assistant district attorney Michael Cutter on law and order from 2008 to 2010. Uh, Elizabeth Guider is a writer and editor with ex extensive experience covering the global uh, entertainment industry uh, for both The Hollywood Reporter and Variety, of which she was executive editor. Uh, Charles Engel is executive vice president of programming for Universal Media Studios, where he is in charge of the empire, uh, the all of Dick Wolf's Law & Order branded series. And Leslie Jones uh, is the former head of international sales and format production for NBC Universal TV distribution. So she's the one uh, who was instrumental in cutting all these groundbreaking deals in the UK, in France, in Russia uh, for uh, uh, the locally adapted and produced programs. So I thought it would be a good idea to start off with uh, Charles Engel because um, he has some facts and figures to share with us on just how broad the scope is of law and order. And also, well, I hope we'll get to this soon, the, the book uh, on how to translate law and order. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, as you all know, the law and order brand is, uh, is extensive. We've made over 800 episodes of the brand. 20 years of law and order. Uh, we hope going into our 13th year of SVU, I'm sure that'll happen. A 10th year of uh, criminal intent and our first year of law and order LA. Um, all are shooting except the mothership. Um, as a result of the success of those some 800 episodes around the world, uh, Dick, likes to say that there's a Law & Order episode airing 24-7 somewhere around the world, and I'm sure he's right. Uh, just to give you an idea of the number of territories that the brand has is currently playing. Law & Order is in 220 territories. Criminal Intent, 240 territories. SVU, 190, and uh, Law & Order, LA 190. Um, you might say there are not that many countries. I asked the same question when I was getting these facts. That's why I needed this. But apparently they count every island and every, every place. And the, the interesting thing is uh, Dick, the president of Dick Wolf's company, Peter Jankowski, is on his way to Rome today for vacation, which he needs. But he's going to go to the Vatican. And I said, when you get there, tell him that one of the territories is the Vatican. Be sure you ask him how he likes the show. <laughs> so, uh, he said, that's good. I'll give him something to, get him something to talk about. Um, net and net of this is, and I know some people, at least I noticed in the previous ones, were taking notes. These are uh, incredible numbers. Um, uh, and it bodes the success of the brand. And from that, here we are, and... 
so now that we have these figures, I mean, it seems obvious now uh, that this was going to be a great success, that it was going to be translated into other countries. Uh, but it wasn't that obvious at the beginning, was it? I mean, it is a, a cerebral show, this procedural. Uh, it, is, uh, it doesn't concentrate on character or a lot of action. Uh, and it's very New York-centric. You know, so what was it about Law and Order that allowed it to be so translatable to other countries? You want to take that, Elizabeth? Well, I, I, I think you're right that it is more difficult. I, I do remember that in the beginning with, uh, it would, be, would have been in the early 90s yeah. when uh, American television, as you know, they had been selling American shows around the world mm -hmm. since 1949. But the revenues weren't that great until, mm -hmm. it, w it was cyclical, but around 92, 93, I think there were four, let's just put this in context, four or five American series that started really driving the revenues up. And those were The X-Files, The Simpsons, ER, and in a sense, Law and Order, in that all of a sudden you had four, there were probably two or three others, but four major series that were so well done in their own way and in their own genre that the rest of the world really did sit up and take notice. Not only did they take notice in terms of the ratings and getting them cleared, if you like, on these mm -hmm. stations, but I think those were the ones that galvanized the local industries, especially in Europe, to think about we've got to do better than what we've been doing in our own local production. I'll never forget a German buyer who said to me, Germany is a huge buyer of American shows. They spend a lot of money on them when they buy them. I'll never forget a German buyer in the early 90s saying to me about law and order, I guess RT, it was RTL and they had just bought it, and he said, they do the three R's. And I thought he meant reading, writing, and arithmetic. What is he talking about? He said, the three R's. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the three R's. Rigor of the template, mm -hmm. relevancy of the stories, and repeatability. Mm. of the episodes. Mm. Now, these buyers are pretty mm -hmm. smart. I will never forget him saying, that's why we bought it. Now, and I think that sparked, in particular, the German industry, along with some of those others, to really think about, we have to raise the bar in our own territory. And eventually they did, and that will take us on into a whole nother cycle and whatnot. But it was in the early 90s on the backs mm -hmm. of shows like Law and Order mm -hmm. that it became clear, probably in Britain too, which has a great, a great television tradition, don't get me wrong, but the writing mm -hmm. of Law and Order and some of the others, I think stunned the BBC into thinking, we can't just have auteur writers, one who goes into a room and decides to do six episodes over and out. We have to think about mm -hmm. other ways of doing fiction. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was one of the crucial moments in international television was when those shows mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really hit big in Europe. Mm -hmm. Dick has a sign on his desk in his, um, his office on the lot, and it's really simple. It says, it's the writing stupid. <laughs> and um, that, uh, that it, it's very true. You know, um, audiences overseas are, are intelligent, just like the most audiences here and, and so <laughs> forth. And uh, they recognize, particularly within in a lot of the major cities around the world, that it's really intelligent, tele, intelligent television. And the stories are good, the writing is good, and that's really what hits it home. Also, the structure of it, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's a miniature movie. Yeah. You sit down for your hour and, and you get the whole story. You don't have to come back next week and, and so forth. So that, that speaks to the repeat, repeatability and so forth. But, you know, ultimately it really is the stories. And Barbara, you've done so much comparative study of legal dramas in, in France, in the U.S., in the U.K. 
Uh, what do you think was that, the, what drew it out universally? Well, first of all, I agree that the structure was extremely important in getting the mm -hmm. French, for example, the French audiences to follow and to become addicted. Mm -hmm. Because it allow, it, it, the structure of it allows a, a, a slow training mm -hmm. of how to follow a, a, a legal drama, how, not only a television legal drama, but a real life legal drama. What are the stages? What is, re, what is repeated in procedure? And then as the show developed and the French audiences became more and more addicted, they became more and more sophisticated to questions on the law. And one of the tremendous contributions of the series is to deal with legal issues that are in debate among jurists today. So it brought the public to a point where they could really partake in what's going on as a citizen. And I think that that made them, the ratings went up and so they continued buying and then they became interested in producing their own your Even when the legal system was different in France and different in the UK as well. Well, the legal system in the United Kingdom is not different. The ritual in court mm -hmm. is different. Um, the legal system in France is very different. It's not at all, it's, it's based on the Roman codified system. What has happened, and that was one of the reasons that um, I think the French have started to do their own series, is that many French citizens think that they live in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and when they go to court, they'll call, the, they'll address the judges as votre honneur, which you don't do. You don't call a judge your honor, you call him Mr., Ma, Monsieur, Madame le Président, because we have a three panel judge. They ask for their Miranda rights when they are arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so the confusion got the ministry very angry, mm -hmm. and there has been an mm -hmm. effort, therefore, to have French productions that would perhaps set things right. Yes. Well, particularly in France, the reason why they chose to go with um, criminal intent is because it deals less with the legal system. Mm -hmm. And the uh, adaptations that, are, that have been chosen around the world are, are primarily criminal intent and SVU, except in the, in the UK where they have done the mothership, but it's because those deal you know, less with that courtroom aspect. And in essence, murder is murder in most places. Plus, yes. just one thing, the French love investigation. There's a long tradition in France, and I think this may be true in other in continental European countries, they'll, they'll make a, an antique broker, an investigator, they'll, they, they, the, so the pol police shows have been very popular. Mm -hmm. So um, we can understand then why the UK uh, chose to do the mothership, and France chose to do criminal intent. So why did Russia choose to do special victims unit? Actually, Russia does both special oh, victims right. unit yes. and yes. criminal intent. Right. Um, it's, uh, they have a huge appetite for television there, and the channel that it is on in Russia is NTV, which is the channel that's historically been the home for a lot of cop shows and, and things like that. And um, they needed volume is really what it, what it came down to. And uh, so it was easier to bifurcate that and say, okay, do criminal intent and SVU. And they aren't even, in, they're about in year four and they've done 168 episodes, wow. um, which is you know, significantly more than would be done here in that, in that amount of time. So it's, you know, a lot of that has to do with, it, it's also a bit more character driven. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, a, it's inch by inch, and then, you know, hopefully, ultimately, they will also go with the mothership, and that's, that's a goal there in mm -hmm. Russia, is to ultimately have that one on. But back to your point, Constance, about it is true that the more cerebral the television is, clearly the all outside of English-speaking territories is going to be a little harder a sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Dick Wolf makes intelligent television and probably the flagship, mm -hmm. if you had to say, is mm -hmm. wouldn't you say probably the most the most talky, the most literate. And and that does make it harder for the mainstream commercial mm -hmm. networks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that aren't English speaking. It just it just is. And so probably their rate I'm guessing the ratings for the flagship are probably not as high abroad in most territories as they are for SVU and CI, mm -hmm. as on a generally sure. speaking, well, one well, would think. Right, well, in um, speaking to that point, for instance, in, in Russia, when you look at the ratings, the St. Petersburg in, in Russia, on average, there's a 39 share, 
when both CI and SVU are on. And in Moscow, it is a, m more in the mid-20s, and a lot of that has to do with St. Petersburg being a very intellectual city. And um, Moscow, uh, the bigger city, it, it takes in different demographics and so forth, but it is definitely considered an intellectual, uh, an intellectual show there, without a doubt. But in, in the UK, uh, the Mothership, I think, is, is one of the top-rated shows, right, in the mm -hmm. UK. And I find it fascinating that they're using stories from the first five years of Law and Order. So in terms of it being like current and immediate, I mean, of course, it's culturally up to date, yeah. but mm -hmm. actually the stories are from like 20 years ago, and that's yeah. kind of incredible that you could take those stories and transplant them in the UK now and then have an audience respond like that. I guess that means that ripped from the headlines yeah. sometimes <laughs> are, it, right. is as universal and timeless right. as, mm -hmm. sure. you know, sometimes it's, it, it really, they are ripped from the headlines, but sometimes these problems last a lot longer right. than we think. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, th that's just the question, is that they, they are inspired by stories from the headlines, but then they go on to discuss issues mm. that, that, that separate themselves from the headline stories. And that's what I think makes them uh, last over the years. The issues don't go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know, don't forget that even you know, if there are 190 countries around the world that are, that are airing Law and Order, a lot of them are only in season two and three and so forth. So it is, you know, the timely, the, the timelessness of the stories that, that you know, it, it speaks to. We might recognize something here, but in, be it in France or, or anywhere else, they won't recognize the story other than, oh, great, another murder mystery. This might not be relevant, but I, I do find it interesting that the show began in New York, because, I mean, I'm a Brit, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> and I played a New Yorker. But I love New York, and it's my favorite city in the world, and to me it's the, it is one of the most sort of multicultural melting pot. It's its own country to me. It's not really America. New York's its own little country. Uh, but it's like anything can happen in New York, and I find it fascinating that it started there. And I remember Dick saying that you could take stories that happened anywhere in the world mm -hmm. and transpose them into a story inside New York, and it would work. And now it's sort of going the other way around. It's coming out of New York and into the world. Yeah. So. Sure. Fascinating. And just uh, for a moment, going back to um, uh, why it even happened uh, that original law and order shows started being made in other countries, uh, could you take us right back to the beginning, Charles? Uh, well, I suspect that the reason that the shows um, they did so well in the foreign countries, but in some of the foreign countries, uh, as uh, Barbara and I were talking about earlier, in some of the foreign countries, they could not play them in prime time. Uh, that was pre-cable. Uh, so in order to get them into prime time, because they were doing so well, Leslie went out and sold the formats so that they could make their own and put them in prime time. I'll take it from another point of view. I think by the year 2000, most of the Europeans had caught up production value-wise. They had learned a lot of lessons from the Americans and they had film traditions of their own and their television got better, noticeably better, their own local mm. production. Television is a very national industry, not like the, the film business, which has always been more international. And right around the year 2000, the revenues that the Hollywood studios were making from selling all their shows abroad flattened. It wasn't going up as much as the studio bosses and Wall Street wanted. And so the Americans, I think, wisely thought, what can we do to boost our revenues? And one of the ways is if you can't beat them if you can't pump any more out of simply selling the shows that they make in America, which they continue to do, you, you go local. You beat them at their own game, or at least you join their game. Ergo, you set up local production units in the UK, in France, in India, of all places, which is where Sony really made amazing strides doing that. In other words, uh, we don't just want to sell our American shows. We want to go over there and either partner with local producers or 
or sell directly to a broadcaster or take our best product or our product that hasn't been in prime time for a while and make lo local versions or convince somebody else to make local versions. So I would say before Universal did it, I think, uh, I think Sony really did pioneer this. Mm -hmm. And they took things like, who's the boss? The nanny? <gasps> married with children, which were already old and off the air, and certainly not in prime time abroad, and remade them in, indeed, in mm -hmm. Russia, of all places, all in different places. Mm -hmm. And they kind of worked, you know? It took a lot of effort, and some of them worked, some of them didn't. And then I think the other studios, sort of seeing that and, and knowing, you know, if one didn't take brain surgery to realize it, thought, we should be doing this for some of our product. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they've had varying success. I think Law and Order has had really good success, but some of them worked and some of them didn't work. Mm -hmm. Takes a lot of, it's very labor intensive though, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You too, I mean, yeah. you're, you're in that business. Very labor intensive to do these local while versions. It's, while it's true that there was a bit of a push strategy in terms of mining assets and, and things like that, there was also a lot of pull there as well because ultimately it's human nature for people to want to watch television where they see the places they know, things, you know, uh, th their own country, their own language, and, and their own cultural, cultural issues are addressed and, and so forth. And while it is great to see New York and, you know, it's a fascinating place and, and so forth, people do, you know, local content is king. Mm -hmm. If you look at in any ratings anywhere in the world, pretty much most of your top 10 shows are going to be local shows. So that they were also wanting that. Hey, yes, we have gotten up to the point where we can make these and you know, let's look at other things. And they started with comedies because you make a comedy in the studio. You don't have to go out like Law and Order and you know, shoot on the streets, shoot on location and so forth, which is extremely labor intensive, requires a bigger crew, a lot more money and, and so forth. So there were some economics there speaking as well. And, um, you know, the, these Law and Orders were some of the first uh, one hour on location drama formats that were, were sold around the world. So uh, even before creating the original programming in other countries, uh, just with the syndicated market, uh, what kinds of adaptations, modifications have to be made uh, to be able to get syndicated uh, Law and Order into various countries? You mean in terms of dubbing or in terms in of... In terms of dubbing, but also in terms of uh, 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 cultural and political concerns? Well, in the Mideast, they don't sell all the episodes, as I understand it. In that well, there, I mean, there, is, there are certain territories where there are censorship issues. Yes. So you can sell an episode, or you can sell a full season of something or other, but there's always a little clause in there that says, you know, if it doesn't pass the censors and so forth, you know, this episode can be replaced or we don't have to pay for it and we'll return it and, and things like that. So, you know, in terms of the U.S. episodes, that's something that is uh, addressed in the territories where, where those are issues, but it's not an issue in, in most territories. Uh -huh. It's a question of also of timing when they'll program the more, um, for example, SVU is always late at night because mm -hmm. they're, they're at, uh, Beaches of time. That's not what I'm saying. Watersheds. That's right. Where you can have certain content, and mm -hmm. and the, the uh, there's a superior council of audiovisual in France that's very very strict mm -hmm. about these things. Mm -hmm. So, why don't you walk us through uh, what it's like uh, to uh, create an original program in another country? I mean, how do you start that? Do you you get contacted by the people in the other country, uh, or do you go out and look for possibilities for doing it? It's definitely uh, both. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's it, you hope people, you can sit at your desk and people will call up and say, oh, I want to buy your show. Um, doesn't happen, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, you know, a lot of it is you getting out there and you also have to sit there and, and educate yourself on, you know, what, what is their do judicial system like? Is, what is it like? What are the other shows in the territory that are airing? that are similar to this show. So you can be mm -hmm. smart when you speak to them and, and say, well, I think this would do well for these reasons instead of saying, oh, hey, I have this great product. You know, here it is. It's a nice, you know, a stainless steel refrigerator and it cools your food. You know, you have to think in your, while you're pitching it, you have to say, this is how it could be adapted to work for you locally because you're really wanting them to spend a lot of money. 
So it's not just the format fees that they're going to pay you, but they're going to have to produce this from scratch, and they're responsible for all that. And we just sit back and, in essence, reap the benefits. Um, but we help them along in the process of, of doing it. But that's, you know, it's... Like creating the book. Right. Well, that, the Bible, yes. The Bible. The Bible is very helpful. The boot camp also. Um, once that? that we call it boot camp because it's a relatively rigorous process where when, when the format is sold, then there are five or six executives that, that come along, along with head writers and, and so forth, and basically live with the American productions and learn how we do it here and ask lots of questions. And uh, those are always fascinating conversations, particularly with the writers and, and so forth, and adapting and um, scouting locations and, and things like that. Every aspect is covered, including on how to make really good-looking, believable blood. That was probably <laughs> the biggest production issue in, in Russia, because they, um, up to that point, would use some odd formulation of, of ketchup with something else. And uh, our guy taught them how to make blood, and they how were thrilled. Yes, well, it's a secret. Oh, you have to buy the format oh, okay. first. <laughs> so, as I understand it, in the book that you give to the shows in other countries, the format shows, it tells them everything about how you create an episode in eight days. It's a how-to book. It's a how-to book. Yeah, and uh, we discovered that when they first came over to see how we did it, and they stood around just, they couldn't believe that we were doing it as efficiently and as effectively as we do it. So we put together um, a production book. It was outside earlier. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see it. We'll put it back out there. But it, it takes criminal intent, SVU, Law and Order, this one happens to be criminal intent. And from the very concept, script, production, all the things that go into production, the budget, the casting, all the way through to a DVD at the end, so that they can take this and follow it right on through and say, OK, got it. This is how we do it. Um, they do it the way they want to do it, but at least they can see it from our point of view, how we did it. What most surprised them? Just how quickly it could all be done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although there was a lot of give and take on, on both sides because I think our guys learned a lot of things from, from the other teams. Mm -hmm. um, some of the takeaways that were a little bit negative was is, is our, uh, the criminal intent production staff found out that they get an hour and a half break for lunch in France, and in their contracts, <laughs> X amount of bottles of wine are required, which is true. And so they thought, hmm, you know, things like that. But no, the, the guys here, um, you know, it takes eight days to shoot, on average, um, you know, these episodes. And uh, in Russia, for instance, they shoot um, the same in about two and a half days. So there was a little efficiency that, that they learned. The production values aren't quite um, up there with the American version and so forth, but it's, it's pretty solid, and especially for doing it in, in two and a half days. And there were certain shortcuts that they did. But we, you know, we have laws, we have rules, regulations, and I mean, it, it's Russia, so um, <laughs> things are a bit more fluid. And you can get away with certain things, but you know we'd have our long, you know, 18, 19 hour shooting days and so forth. Well, what has been an, uh, the most what what is the most challenging translation of Law and Order? I mean, and how would you rank them? I mean, in the UK, you know, in France, and in Russia. The language and the law. It's very, very difficult to translate terms that don't exist from one system to the other. And in writing, in, in dubbing, you have, a, you have a certain space for the words that you mm -hmm. can't explain what that means. Mm -hmm. So there are things that they have to uh, find ways of circumventing. Yet, it's an American series, and so they can't talk about French law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know the answer to the question, but I know that I'm very grateful that I was in the American show because I could move around in the courtroom. 
<gasps> and didn't have to wear a silly wig. <laughs> <laughs> Which must be an issue when you're yeah. shooting, because the mm -hmm. only action in the courtroom mm -hmm. is the jury going mm -hmm. like that. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a like more a state place, yeah. right. Right. like a yeah. tennis game. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you can stand up. So, stand up. In, yeah. in terms of the adaptations yes. ver versus the American ones being shown abroad, um, I would say that it was. This isn't a translation issue, but but the biggest hurdle in terms of getting deals done and so forth was probably in France, um, and we were discussing this earlier with um, dealing with the French guilds and the rules and the regulations there and, and so forth. Because what what makes sense for local adapt adaptations to be done is not only do they get great ratings, but then they count as local productions. And most countries have quotas. We don't have those here in this country because pretty much everything, except for a few things we take from Canada, are American. But for instance, in, in France, and the, the quotas change on a relatively regular basis, but you know, X percent has to be locally produced, and they have to be French writers and French directors and so forth. And it was a huge hurdle to get the, the French version of Criminal Intent approved as a French production so that it could count for TF1 under their, uh, their French production budgets and, and so forth. And, um, that, that's something that isn't an issue you deal with in every country, but mm -hmm. there are quite a few, so. Well, I noticed that uh, there was quite a bit of laughter when uh, Law and Order SVU Russia came up. And I think people have to get their minds around, you know, how can there be a law and order in a country with, yeah, there might be some law, but there's not much order, or at least that's our perception of it. So. How do, you, how do you negotiate those differences? In other words, the, with, the, with the kinds of uh, ideas about uh, 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 law and ethics and policing and the state, you know, when you're trying to do criminal intent and special victims unit in Russia? In terms of getting those particular deals done, um, we did have to get approval from the Kremlin, and um, a lot of that had to do because most of the major broadcasters in Russia are uh, still state-owned. Um, NTV, which is the broadcaster that, that both of these shows are on, is owned by Gazprom, but Gazprom is owned by the state. So uh, there was definite concern there that there would be um, outside Western influence, in this series commenting about the Russian uh, legal system and uh, policing and, and things like that. But, you know, we sat down with them and it's really honest, here, look at the episodes. You know, as you will see, ultimately, not all the time, but most of the time, the guys in the white hats win. And um, there, there were issues where we did have to deal with um, the, the cultural adaptation of the perception of the Russian mm -hmm. audience of um, Russian police having a little bit of corruption. Um, yes, that perception exists everywhere, mm -hmm. but there that's sort of something that is uh, assumed. So that had to be addressed and, and things like that. And, and there were no directives made by the Kremlin or any, anything like that, but they just wanted to make sure that yes, indeed, this was going to be a Russian, Russian production and, and we wouldn't be influencing it you know, mm -hmm. that much. Did but they have script approval? No, no. And have there been any objections after the fact? I mean, after the shows have aired? No, there, there, uh, there's been a lot of debate mm -hmm. that has opened up. And um, what's really fascinating is uh, I was actually on the phone this morning with one of the executive producers, and he was discussing the, um, the reforms that are coming along in the... Uh, the legal system, and a lot of it is tinged with comments about about the local law and orders, which is um, something that is uh, it, it's kind of nice to see that there is an a, a bit of an open debate like that that mm -hmm. is going on. Well, one of uh, uh, Barbara's emphases in her research is on how legal shows, uh, including Law and Order, uh, educate people. You know, I mean, uh, sometimes it's one of the primary forms of people coming to understand about law 
and the court system uh, and policing, you know, uh, in, in, their, in their locales? It creates expectations, first of all. It creates uh, awareness and, and um, values. And all of these things are important mm -hmm. in terms of feeling a, a, a responsible citizen, mm -hmm. for one. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's also extremely useful. Law and order has helped me teach uh, in common law to, to French jurists because, as, as it was said earlier this, this morning, the law is stories. The law is all about mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And if you take the story out of the teaching of the law, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. Mm -hmm. There may be another, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, you're, you're talking about Russia. I'm wondering, though, another thing that it could teach is when I look at the characters in, um, well, let's just take SVU and, and Criminal Intent, it's, um, generally speaking, it's men and women working together, you know, in the top roles. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if in some of the territories where you're, you're intimating where it could be more difficult, I'm thinking the Mideast, I'm thinking Malaysia, you know, some territories, certainly the Mideast, mm -hmm. Imagine a format, a format deal somewhere in the Mideast where you have a, um, you know, a Catherine Irbe, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the, 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 or Mariska Hargitay type figure. Could there be, mm -hmm. would those characters have to be changed? Would there have to be two males mm -hmm. or two women? Or I'm just thinking how fascinating that discussion would be, how to keep a male and a female who are working together professionally that teaches a story too, doesn't it? And I'm wondering if, um, if even in the originals, there's been any pushback on those selling in the Middle East, or whether or not there's any talk about doing a format there. Because there, the impact would be even beyond just the legal system. It would be about how people, you know, the sexes work together. Mm -hmm. To take just one instance of what would be a, a really interesting discussion. I don't know, Charlie, are they talking about the Mideast? Well, I, when we first talked about taking the formats abroad, uh, someone said, well, in some countries it'd be 15 minutes. They'd be arrested and shot. <laughs> so, so there... It would not be an and, hour. And we, yeah. So they would be cheaper to make, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Interstitials. Yeah. 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 Are we still there? Are they thinking about the Mideast? <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps, who knows? Who knows? Well, you know what, I mean, and it, you look at, uh, Dick's talked about his uh, affinity for producing, wanting to have a, um, a, a series set in a Muslim country, and, and you know, what makes sense to me in a, in a deal before I left NBC I was working on was um, a Turkish version. And, you know, that's, um, you know, it's, it's a step, you know, in that right direction. Uh, very liberal. Um, Muslim country, but it's, you know, it's something that, hey, if they can do it, gee, we'll look at it here. But you also have to remember in the Middle East what is uh, extremely popular, the, the, the more popular channels are the pan-regional broadcasters like NBC, which is the uh, uh, Middle Eastern Broadcasting Corporation. And they do not have as many restrictions as would, um, you know, uh, Egyptian television or um, uh, channel that is just purely Saudi Arabian and so forth. So they could decide, yes, let's do a version, let's set it in Lebanon. And, you know, that would be perfectly acceptable there. Yeah. But it would still be your, you know, your Middle Eastern version and, and so forth. But along the same lines, there are also ethnicity issues. And on the panel earlier, it was addressed about um, how ethnically diverse most of these shows are. Mm -hmm. And that's, that it was something, um, that I did not necessarily anticipate having to tackle with the, the two versions in Russia is they don't have, um, on average, ethnic diversity in terms of appearance. Theirs is, is regional. And there was a big debate on the ice tea character with SVU. It's like, well, wh you know, gee, what are we going to make him? Um, oh, you know, let's make him, you know, originally born in Kazakhstan. And, gee, you know, but to me, I, that guy just looks Russian, you know, visually. Oh, but no, when he speaks and so forth, that was different. And the comments that he would make, as well as the Munch character, um, that was another, another issue. And so they just did it, you know, the, the former CIS 
instead of you know Russia in particular. Um, so, uh, what do you think are going to be? Um, do you think that law and order is going to be spreading into other countries, or can you imagine other countries you wouldn't even want to deal with? You know, because you know that it would just be too difficult. I mean, what's the future for it? Well, I, I've always felt. I mean, to me, this is sort of, sort of more like the meta point as opposed to the specifics of translation, but it really is the heart of drama. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because of what Dick created, in essence, you know, the criminal mystery and then the moral mystery. The moral mystery is, has been throughout time, the heart of drama. That is, and this is always gonna be culturally relevant because unfortunately people are still killing each other. So until that ends, this show has a long life. <laughs> I would hope so. The fear, my fear is that with so much of, um, well, so much reality television, which is so much more cost effective, well, not so much more anymore, but more cost effective than drama, you know, one does have to ask the 10 o'clock drama that the networks were so amazing mm -hmm. for and still are, but there are a lot of folks out there who think of it as an endangered species. It, they skew old, they cost a lot of money to make, and the writing and the effort that has to go into them, or at least up until now, has been so amazing, and there is a lot of emphasis as we look. I just looked the other day at the ratings to see what cable shows are really, really doing well. I'm not talking about Mad Men, I'm talking about you know Jersey Shore and you know, 16 and pregnant, and blah, blah, blah. These shows don't cost nearly as much. Their ratings are high, and guess what? They skew young, and that's what advertisers like. So the fear is that, you know, we're going to get probably fewer and fewer of those 10 o'clock dramas. I mean, probably Law and Order holding the fort on the one end, the CSIs on the other end, I say on the other end, meaning more maybe more cinematic and feel, a little more commercial, blah, blah, blah. But these are two great poles of drama, but they aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know, will there ever be another? I mean, I'm saying, mm -hmm. I think these franchises mm -hmm. are fabulous. Will there ever be another one? Will NCIS, for example, you know, lighter in tone and whatnot, manage to become one? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, as tastes change, and I, it, it's a little scary out there. And, and now that NBC has a new owner, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see. Tell us about that. Have we, have we have any <laughs> sense of what Comcast might do? Uh, we're only going to get better. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> a good one. <laughs>but then exporting it. And I'm wondering, is that happening with the Russian producers? Are they exporting the series then to Eastern Europe and other, other spheres where Russian influence and language um, have been a, a big part of the history and the, and the culture? And are the French producers thinking as well that the things that they're producing are potentially export products? Because getting back to Elizabeth's example, drama is very expensive. And when you think of drama, you're not thinking of just spinning it off into cable, but you're thinking satellite, and then you're thinking regional, and then you're thinking spheres of sort of cultural affinity. So is there a way in which what we're seeing is not just localization, but a kind of re-globalization or re-transnationalization that might be on the horizon with some of this? I, I was just wondering if any of that comes up. Yes, that, all of that was addressed in the initial deals. Um, NBC Universal still ultimately owns the copyright, even of locally produced versions. So they handle the distribution um, internationally. And uh, for instance, on the, on the Russian deals, there, even before it hit air in Russia, there were sales done to the Ukraine, 
and to some other uh, former republics. So that, yes, it is. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really is. Yeah, yeah. I think, they, I think they have been regionally rather mm -hmm. successful, and, and Sony certainly has too. I'm curious, this may be more to Charlie, what has been, has anybody evaluated the impact on the original American productions in territories where the formats are so popular? In other words, have the ratings, have the ratings gone down for the originals, the original American versions where there are the formats that have been Where localized. they're making their own? Yeah, homegrown. where they're making their own. Has there been much of an impact? Well, Leslie, maybe you could answer it. Um, yeah, no, not really. Actually, quite the contrary. What's interesting is, is that, um, and not to speak about Russia all the time, but they're law and order obsessed. It's, it's interesting, and ironically, but um, they, uh, the mothership was off, was on in Russia, did not do overly well for, for a few years. Then it was off. It was still licensed, but off. Licensed to the same network that we did the, the local versions of, of CI and SVU to. And, on, and those started doing so well that they brought <coughs> the mothership back, and now it's doing extremely well. It's almost as if you know they had to be reintroduced to that. But they're not really in competitive slots, to Charlie's point earlier, you will have um, the, the American versions on, yes, in prime time in certain territories, maybe on secondary channels and so forth, but on the major networks, they're going to air in pre-watershed or post-watershed and you know, late at night or, or whatever that may be. So they're not really particularly competing. And to your point out there about the question of do, do they go elsewhere? The UK version came back here. It's English, obviously, so they didn't have to to uh, put voiceover or subtitles. Some of us voted that we would like to have had the UK versions play Saturday night on NBC. Um, I can't tell you why that didn't happen, but I think had they done that, they would have enjoyed a better number than multiple repeats of shows that were just on a couple of nights before, to your point. Also, the, the thing about the UK version is, is it gives NBC Universal a European asset to sell because there's European content quotas. And so it is um, more valuable, for instance, to a French channel mm -hmm. to buy a UK production than it is to buy an American production because they can fit under the, the European content. So there's also that kind of play as well. It's a bit strategic. You, you've talked about selling the product and uh, format fees, and, and you've used the word format. And I just wondered if you could give a brief explanation of what the format consists of other than sound effects. I mean, we got that sense that the opening credits seem very similar, but what else is sort of required of a, when you negotiate, what is, what is required? What must be in the, the local production? You have your Bible. Yeah. The, what's, in, what's in each episode until, as Leslie indicated, they run out of our episodes or want to write their own, is we give them the scripts. Um, and um, that's part and parcel of the deal. Now, in each country, the judicial systems are different. Their legal systems are different. But they're close enough so that these work. And that's what we give them. We also, yes, we give them the format being half of it or some of it is the rest and then the trial. Um, and um, the cast. Not, we don't give them our cast, but we show them how it's done. And as Leslie was saying also, in some countries, it doesn't quite work the same way. But the, a format is a format. It's what's the general premise of what these shows are. Special Victims Unit, you all know the shows as well as we do. Uh, that's unique to that. There's a crime, sexual crime committed. Uh, our cops come in, uh, find out how it was done, 
who did it, and then we prosecute. But law and order, the same way. Criminal intent is much more cerebral. Um, now Vincent and Katie are back doing the new ones now that will go on USA. Plug. Uh, U <laughs> USA, USA in June. Um, and uh, they're really extraordinary. Uh, Vincent's back to being the real Vincent, and it re they really look terrific. Um, please watch them. But, uh, so, but what's unique to that is he's a, a cerebral thinker. He's wise and knows how to, in the aria at the end of each episode, how to trap the person, much as a, a, a guy named uh, Colombo did a while back. <laughs> Yeah, all the, there's the general concept of the show, but there are pillars. And, and when I say pillars, it's you know, basically like saying, okay, this is what the foundation of the show is, and these are the things from which you cannot deviate. These other things, you can put your walls, the non-load-bearing walls, in different spots, but you have to have the, the rest in, in this way. And that's, um, for instance, the aria in Criminal Intent at the end. Um, there is about uh, eight minutes or so of um, Vincent in the original where he goes on. It's, you know, the gotcha moment where he gets them to, you know, break down and confess and, and so forth in his unique manner. That's one of the pillars of that particular show. Um, another pillar is, is it's, you know, it's, it's two detectives. And you have, so it's, it's the, the cast, the number of the cast. and. In general, their, their personalities and so forth, because those have to be consistent for the scripts to work, even if they're culturally adapted. So you have various things for, and also the writing style. Um, and a major overall pillar is, um, even though it's obviously fiction and it's a heightened sense of reality, there are certain things that Law & Order is known for in terms of being precise and accurate and just not really making up stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's something we ran into in France. There was an adaptation of a certain murder that happened to occur with uh, Japanese knot tying. And they just didn't do their proper research and happened to change it in a certain way. And when we were uh, approving the scripts, you know, we caught that and we said, well, this does not make sense because this isn't how that's done. And they thought it was funny that we were being um, so ridiculously precise about that, but that's part of the hallmark of the show, is there's got to be some believability to things. But to this lady's point, very specifically, Vincent D'Onofrio, when he's doing his interrogation, that's why I'm asking about mm -hmm. the French version, mm -hmm. he, well, Linus, you could, you know, he leans in, right? right. You know, that, that the way he moves his head, that's not a pillar. It's not a pillar. So what did Vincent, <laughs> what did, uh, I was going to ask, how did the actor, the French actor, mm -hmm. what's his, does he have a gimmick, I mean, a, a thing yeah. that identifies he's, his he's, way of interrogating? Well, it's interesting because at first it's uh, the, the actor who play that, plays that role or played that role in France is Vincent Perez, yes. um, a very famous actor, uh, even well known here. And... Um, he at first wanted to come up with his own little gimmick. Yes. And there was an, uh, an episode that he did, and, and he, he was doing some kind of strange things, and it just really looked awkward. And ultimately, he reverted and, and started doing exactly what, mm -hmm. what D'Onofrio did. But that was a choice. That was his choice. Okay. That was the director's choice and so forth. That's not something that we say, OK, you have to do it. The, the Russian version. Um, the, the guy who plays that role, he has his own little quirks as well. He's very quiet. He paces a lot. Um, he does a lot of this. And uh, he has this funky scar in his cheek that is slightly sexy and brooding. And, and so he plays up that role, you know, a little bit more because that's, you know, that, that's not the role that, that, that Vincent plays here. So it's, you know, they've got their own little that, that's adaptations. That's different to, like, the pillars on the mothership. Where the pillars really are the functions of those characters. Mm -hmm. yes. You got six main characters. You got the detectives in the beginning and the DAs in the second. So when I saw, you know, the the Law and Order UK, it, Dick said this actually. It's like watching something that's exactly the same and completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, you, you literally see 
the scenes, as uh, I, I, I know that scene, I've played that scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and you knew exactly the rhythm of each thing and where it was going to break into the second half, but everybody was individual and independent as characters yes. and true to that culture. Yes. 